Amen. One more thing to know that our Lord does uh, stick with us forever, might be going on. If you have your Bibles with you, you would have to turn to the book of Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, very familiar verses, is where we'll take our text this morning. Uh, while you're turning there, I meant to mention, and it's a very minor thing, I'm hoping anyway, I am going to have my left knee surgery on May the 9th. So uh, I might not be, uh, I may need to get a little lift for missions conference to get up and down these steps, but I'm just glad that, uh, to have it done. So I'll go for a pre-op on the 8th and the surgery's the 9th. So y'all pray for me in that. Ecclesiastes chapter 3 in the very first verse. Ecclesiastes chapter 3 in the first verse. Solomon says, to everything there is a season and to a time to every purpose under heaven. A time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to click up, to pluck up that which is planted. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to break down and a time to build up. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to cast away stones, and a time to gather stones together. A time to embrace, and a time to refrain from embracing. A time to get, and a time to lose. A time to keep, and a time to cast away. A time to rend, and a time to sow. A time to keep silence, and a time to speak. A time to love, a time to hate, a time of war, and a time of peace. What profit hath he that worketh in that wherein he laboreth? I have seen the travail which God hath given to, to the sons of men to be exercised thereby, to be exercised in it. He hath made everything beautiful in his time, and he hath sent the world to their heart, so that no man can find out, can find out the work that God maketh from the beginning to the end. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you and we praise you for an opportunity to be in your house this morning among your people. Lord, we thank you for a good building to gather in and out of the elements this morning, and we praise you for that. Lord God, we pray that you'd meet with us this morning, Lord, that you'd come around this place and that you'd talk to your people. God, that you would deal with sinners. Uh, we can't do that, Lord, but you can, and that you would grant them eternal life this morning, Lord. Encourage us even where we stand. We know by your word there's always problems at hand. Lord, revive us again according to your word you've promised. And we pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Now, some uh, very familiar verses of scriptures. Uh, writing of Solomon. The Bible attributes Solomon to be the wisest man to ever live. Now, if you know his writings, this was the last one. And some things that he kind of put together from the sum of his whole life. Now, and even no matter what age you are this morning, and, uh, particularly if you're past 40, you understand that life is a lot more about, a lot, there are a lot more things to life than things. When you're young, things is what it's all about. Cars, homes, uh, you go on and on and on with that, but the older you get, the less meaning each of those things have. And I believe Solomon was beginning to get that. He was beginning to see, even though he was very wealthy, it really didn't mean a whole lot. In the first verse, he says, To everything there is a season. Now, a lot of people will want to preach you a health and wealth uh, sermon this morning, but I'm here to tell you there's a season for everything. There's a season for you to be happy. There's a season to grieve. There's a season to be mad. There's a season to get glad. You know, used to when I was a boy, if, I, if my, I'm in this one here, we've been out of trouble with it. And give me one of those faces. And she says, you get your face straightened up or I'll straighten it up for you. And, uh, uh, you know, and, and so if there was a time for one, there was a time for the other. And so whatever condition you're in this morning, it's not constant. You may be happy and ready to walk the back of the pew, but tomorrow's coming. Uh, there's a different day tomorrow. And, and so we as the Lord's people, uh, we don't live in a constant. You know, some people will also uh, teach and preach if you're not happy all the time, well, probably you're not saved. Well, you know, 
the Bible says this concerning David, that he was a man after God's own heart, and David spent some low, low, low times. So certainly it has no attachment to your salvation, the times that we must go through. And I tell you what this uh, I have found is your different times, your different seasons teach you patience. And to everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under heaven. Now, if you don't get anything else from this message, before I lose you this morning, get this. God works by purpose. He has a purpose in everything he does. There's never been one time that's caught him by surprise. And when we see tragedy, and we're going to, just remember God has a purpose. I don't know what it is. You probably won't know for a number of years. You may never know. But God always works by purpose. There are reasons by what he does. And, he, and you know what? And he, if, if we just grab a hold of that truth, I think a lot of our boo-hoos would simply go away because we know God has a reason. Verse 2. A time... To be born. Now, everybody can say amen to that, but you know what? There, there's not one individual that's been born. Every one of us has a life in this building, uh, right down to my youngest grandbaby, and it didn't take us by surprise when they were born. Well, I'll say this it didn't take God by surprise. I'm sure these women wish it could have come sooner by the end of, of their term. But see, it happened when God wanted it. And it's never, it's never, it's always been that way. And uh, the, the thing of it is, hearing Donna's midwife stories for 20 years, I've come to this, babies born when God wants them to be born, and they're not going to be born until he wants them to be born. There's no way to rush that process. A time to be born and a time to die. Now, Everybody gets, we, you know, kind of, you on the born part, you can keep them. On the die part, you lose them. But you know what? I don't know when it'll be, but you're looking at a dead man. One day, my life will cease to exist. Y'all lay what's left out there in the cemetery, and I'm done. A time to die. You know what? The only eternal portion of mankind is the inner man anyway. You know, I've often, uh, I've often wondered about the catching away of God's people as it is covered in 1 Thessalonians. It said that we would be caught up and that we'd be changed. Uh, I'm not sure about that. Does that mean that we don't, we don't enter into death? I really don't think so. Because death is damned to everybody. A Adam concluded us in that. So maybe when we got made the changing years up, I don't know. And, and, but I do know this, there has to be a time of dying. And as difficult that is and as hard, the reality is that death is coming. Now, the thing when considering your time of death, are you prepared to go? Are you ready to meet the Almighty? Are you ready to come face to face with the Holy God of all heaven? Are you ready? Because see, that, the question is not if death is coming. The question of that is just when. The big question, do you know the Lord Jesus Christ? Then he says, a time to plant and to plant, a time to pluck up, to pluck up that which is planted. Now, that is, uh, can be a long ways in between there. Now, we're trying to have a big garden this year, want a little bit more maybe to put up in the fall. And we put, we put a lot of stuff out already. But we just to the planting season. Now, one thing we planted this year, and, and Donna got it down from uh, one of the Amish plant stores, is some kind of cherry tree or cherry bush is what they call it. And uh, I, I set it out, and I don't know, Donna said she, she thought that Anna said we'd get something off it this year. But most things... If you plant a fruit tree, listen, it's going to be a while. You ain't going to get it right away. I, I remember when I was a boy, uh, my, my grandmother put out a peach tree, and she said, son, I'll never live to eat off this tree, but you will. And you know what? She was right. It took seven years for it to come, and she was gone a long time before those seven years were, go were gone. See, uh, things you're doing right now is going to come back to you. 
the good and the bad and the not and, and the ugly, it's all going to come back. Because see, when you plant something, it will come back. You know, the Bible says this, and I think it's in uh, Exodus, maybe it's, uh, I believe it's Exodus, that the sin of the father will be on the sons of the third and fourth generation. You know what that is? That, that is just getting what you sowed. That's just bringing back what you planted. And, and so we as the Lord's people, we need to understand and know this morning, we need to plant very carefully because it is coming back. This is another verse that a lot of people would not like. A time to kill. Uh, nobody likes war, but you know what? War is reality. Uh, trying to think back exactly when it was when we went uh, into uh, the first part of the Iraqi war. I just know we were in Dresden, and I think either Donna was expecting Adam or she was expecting Matthew Warren. I just remember she was expecting a child. So either one or the other, we've been at war their whole life. It is just part of who we are. It's part. And, and so, you know, when, when someone or something or a nation gets killed, as crass as it sounds, it's just part of life. But you know what the devil wants to do? Oh, you're going to, then this is horrible. This is going to be terrible. It's going to be the end of the world. And twist and take your mind off the prize. Listen. You know what? We'll wake up in the morning and we'll hear news again of someone dying. It's on the Mexican border or it be in California. People keep dying. That's just how it is. And what we as the Lord's people need to understand is although all those things, although those things can be troubling, don't let it keep you off the prize. A time to weep, a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. Now, uh, in verse 4, he picks on some other pieces of life we may or may not like. And, and that is a time to weep. And, and we always think about grief attached to weeping. You know what? Um, that's not always so. Uh, I remember uh, the first time I traveled... Uh, to the east and, and went to the Ukraine, I was so glad to get back to Tennessee. Don came and picked me up at the airport and I could just cry. Was I upset? No, I was glad to be home. I was glad to see my wife after 14 days. And so just because you're crying doesn't mean sorrow. But there are going to be times like that in your life. And you know what? Your health and wealth teachers and your Benny Hens and all those stupid people like that is going to tell you everything's going just right. No, there are going to be some tough days. There are going to be some hardships. And what we need to do as the Lord's people is just recognize that and, allow, and, and try to stay focused on the prize and, and, and centered on Jesus. And this won't, uh, this won't be as hard for us. I want you to also and, uh, to see at the end of verse 4 and to give you some study thoughts for this week. The Bible says that there is a time to dance. Now, uh, again, Solomon, the son of David, we know that uh, David danced before the Lord, and I'm not sure, and I don't understand uh, exactly the, the praise in that, but the Bible says here there is a time to dance, and, and that's showing excitement and, 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 and exuberation to the Father, it's showing we love Him, and there is a time to do that, apparently, according to the Word of God. And, and so we as Lord's people, sometimes we become very, very critical of people who don't show share our views exactly. Maybe we should just pray for them. A time to cast away stones, a time to gather stones together, a time to embrace, and a time to refrain from embracing. A time to get, and a time to lose. Now in verse 6, it's a very unusual verse. Uh, guess what? You're going to lose sometime. You know, you know, the old saying was back in the 80s, and there's, there's a lot of truth in it. There was a song, I read the back of the book, and we win. And, and we do. But we don't win every time. See, there are going to be losses along the way. And there are going to be things that we simply do not understand. And that's when either you're faithful or you're not. When you get up and go, when there seems no reason left 
to do it. He says those times are coming. Those times are present. And what we need to do is in those times, again, just focus on the throne and focus on the Lord Jesus Christ. And he'll certainly, certainly help us do that. Verse 7. A time to rend or rip. A time to sow. A time to keep silent. Or silence. And a time to speak. Now, in verse 7, he is an unusual portion of his word because most of us have a problem keeping our mouth shut. And he says here, it's a time to speak, but it's also a time to keep silent. You know what? Sometimes the best thing you can do is just keep your mouth shut. And you know what? You may know the word of God, and certainly we should at the right time instruct people in the word of God. But if you're doing it deliberately just to make someone mad, what good have you accomplished? Yeah. What good have you accomplished? And, and, and so we as the Lord's people sometimes our most difficult thing, as the Bible teaches here, just to keep our mouths shut. And the reason why it's part of this flesh, and the Bible even indicates it's some of the worst part of the flesh, just keep your mouth shut. Just don't say anything. A time to love and a time to hate. A time of war and a time of peace. What profit hath he that worketh in that wherein he laboreth. Now, that almost sounds like a, a double-twisted verse there in verse 9. But what, what it's saying, what does a prophet, a man, working in his own labor? Now, you know what? About the best you can do is make a living. I'll tell you two things about finances as your pastor. The more you make, the more you'll speak. That's what finances has taught me. Uh, honoring God and what you have. And you know what? <laughs> Me and John was talking about this. She, she, made some, she made some kind of gift today, this salmon stuff, and it made out of this little tiny thin lunch meat. Now, when we were in college and we didn't have much money, we always had to, and some kind of budding ham or something like that, but it was, it was cheap. And like back then, like 89 cents and or cheaper. And, and that's what we had to eat. And you know what? It was good. You can look at me and tell me I never went hungry. Uh, but we want the best, don't we? And now what we have is very different. And maybe in mankind's eyes would be a lot better. But you know, does it not do the exact same thing? Does it not fill your gut? But we want the best, don't we? And, and, and so we find here, I think what... Uh, Solomon is trying to get at is don't focus so much on your work that you spend your whole life with nothing but a career. And, and he was king. He was the ruler. And he came down to this conclusion, I've worked all my life. And what do I have? Was he rich? You betcha. But you know what? At the very same time as being rich, he became an idolater. Right? The Bible says he was. And, and so can we lose focus? I believe we can. Can we forget what's important? I know we can. And, and so what we need to begin to focus on is our life in the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and, and that's pretty much what we need to keep our focus on. I have seen the travail which God gives to the sons of men to be exercised therein. Now, I want you to see the travail is a word that has to do with labor as though having a child. And he said, I've seen that in the sons of men. So I ask you this morning, what's causing your pain? Now, I don't know much about it. I never was an OB nurse. I never want to start being an OB nurse. But I know that that pain there has a purpose. And the end result is a beautiful, wonderful new child. So, what pain you're experiencing, what's it working you toward? See, a lot of our pain is pretty needless, ain't it? A lot of pain we put ourselves into. So, no, no purpose at all, really, right? 
So I ask you, what, 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 what is your issue today and where is it leading you? What, what, this time tomorrow, is the things you're going to, that you're doing today mean anything at all in eternity? Because when this life is over, is there really anything else that matters? Now, all these hazards and good things, and if you, you notice he said a time to live and a time to die, there was the good and bad on both sides. That's really what he was saying. It takes patience in all. You know, uh, patience, the Bible says patience is a virtue, but patience comes with a price. Because to have patience, you have to go through, through travail. You have to go, you have to have the experience of problems. And you know what? We want the good stuff. If you went down that list and put your preferences, you're going to put a time, you're going to put a time to live or a time to die on your preferences. A time, uh, a, a time to weep and a time to laugh. Which one's going down is what you want to do. You see what I'm saying? And we would like to live and laugh and eat. But you know what? That's, that's not where you get the patience. You get the patience through the death, going hungry, uh, through illness, sickness. Patience comes that way. And, and, and so the next time that you have, a, have, a, have seemingly a hardship in your life, remember that God means it for good, that He wants your patience to be huh, improved. Verse 11. He hath made everything beautiful in his time. Now, it, how do you say everything is beautiful? The Bible says here, he had made everything beautiful in his time. That's part of patience, you know what? That, 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 that's part, you know what? Uh, everything God does is beautiful. And we may not understand it and we may not get it, but everything he does is beautiful and good. It just takes patience, patience to learn it. You know, I, I've told this story many times. I was born with a Wilms tumor. That's a kidney tumor. Totally destroyed my left kidney before I was even born. Took the kidney out seven months later, the day that the Apollo crew, crew walked on the moon. I was in a second surgery, complete abdominal obstruction and full kidney failure. Doctor told mother she said you've got less than five percent chance of survival. Here I am today. You know, I don't know what the purpose of that. Started having seizures, and, and you know, I, I would be lying to you if I didn't say this. It, I like being a nurse. I still like being. I'll be a nurse twenty-five years in May. One month, I graduated the 5th of May, Cinco de Mayo. And, uh, you know, the, the, the epilepsy really made me mad because it took, took away some of the stuff, at least for a short period, that you can do as a nurse. You say, well, why? Would well, you want me to draw your blood while I'm having a seizure? You know, it, it's safety for everybody. I get that. But you know what? It taught me patience. And the next time I started an IV, I enjoyed it because I had to do it a while. You see what I'm saying? There's reasons behind everything that God does. And, and so we, as the Lord's people, we need to begin, begin to use these circumstances to learn patience rather than throwing them back in the mouth of God. And many times that's exactly what we do is say, you know what? I'm not putting up with this. Verse 11, he made everything beautiful in his time. Also, he has set the world in their heart so that no man can find out the work that God maketh from the beginning to the end. Now, the last part I want you to see that no man can figure it out. You know what? Best thing you can do is stop trying to figure out God because he's, he's his own person. He does what seemeth good into himself. What he does is his own business. And see, that's the problem with some of these little religions out there. They think they can control God. Got a real good book. My mother-in-law loaned it to my wife, and I, I took it up before she had time. It said, The Heresy of the Sinner's Prayer. Man, it's good stuff. And you know why the sinner's prayer is a heresy? It puts you in control instead of God. God does what seemeth good unto himself. He don't have to save anybody if he don't want to. Right? 
And, and, and so we see then, as, as, as the Lord's people, that, uh, that we don't have to figure it out, just enjoy it. We don't have to understand the mind of God. Do you enjoy, do you have patience this morning? Now, if you will go over uh, with me to the book of Romans, Romans chapter 5, we'll begin reading in the first verse. Uh, I personally believe that the church at Rome was the defector. I believe that that group became the Catholic Church. And even in Romans chapter 1, you can see that Paul had his concerns of their idolatry even then. This week, you know what? You know what today it is? It's Sunday. <laughs> it is not Palm Sunday. <laughs> you know what Palm Sunday is? It's a Catholic heresy. That's all it is, right? Did the Lord ride on, uh, uh, on a, a little uh, mule and did they praise him as they went? Yes, they did. Did they think, throw out palm, ball, palm boughs? I think they did. But they also threw out clothes. Right. Let's have clothes Sunday. And if you really study that out, it didn't happen on Sunday to start with. But I'm just saying, the church at Rome had some issues long before. And the Lord saw, uh, Paul saw it, and Paul expressed his concern concerning the church at Rome. But I want you to see, he gives them some reminders here, verse 5, uh, excuse me, Romans 5 in the first verse. Therefore being justified by faith. Now, a good sovereign grace church like we are, we enjoy talking about grace, but where's your faith? What, what does the Bible say right there? See, this is the thing about true grace. It always yields faith. That's why I don't have to worry. Every, You know what? I want to study the Word of God, and I do want to understand it. But you know what? If there's a verse in there I don't understand, I take it by faith. Is that not where faith begins? I believe it is. If you don't understand it, and God says it, the best thing to do is just believe it. And that is faith. And I believe that we live in a day and age where our faith on the general is quite small in comparison. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, uh, I won't spend a long time on that, but I do want you to see that the person with faith also has peace. It's kind of funny, isn't it? So maybe if you have no peace, is the, it's kind of proportional to the amount of faith you have. Verse 2, by whom also we have access by faith unto this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations. That's that time of death, the time of sorrow, the time of hardships, the time when you don't have much money. All the, the negative sides, if you will, in Solomon's writing, a time to be born, a time to die, a time to laugh, and a time to cry. All those bad sides, that's our tribulation. And listen, if you don't have some of those, I'd make my calling and election sure. Because they're just as much as a part of walking with Christ is the good stuff. And you know what? The good stuff, although, man, it's good to have... Bible says that this is what's going to this is going to result in faith. This is going to result in uh, in uh, having confidence in the Lord, and most of all, patience. Patience, learning to wait on God. You, you know what the problem? Another problem with your little sinner's prayer thing. There's no patience in it. There's no patience in it. Let's say you say this. And you're on your way to glory. Well, that's not for you to say. That's certainly not for you to even dictate. But it's a quick fix, ain't it? There's no patience there. You see what I'm saying? Uh, you know, if you have children and grandchildren that are lost, the very, very best thing I can give advice to you is pray and have a little patience. Have, pray and pray and have some patience. God's good. Then he says in verse 2, By whom we have access by faith unto this grace wherein we stand, and rejoice in the hope 
of the glory of God. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation worketh patience. Now, I don't know nothing about, I've, I've never worked in a factory, I've toured some factories and don't know much about how, how a line of products goes, but I do know it has to be adjusted at times. A little bit I talked to Matthew about his job when they're making shelving, if they switch the type of shelf they're making, their line doesn't voila and switch. They have to make adjustments along the way. So the new product is different when it hits the end of the line. And you know what? Sometimes the Lord has to make adjustments in us so our faith will grow. So that when we come out on the end, we'll be a better product than what we started with. And it is hard. It is very difficult. And you know what? If we're not very careful, we will question, why God, why? Look to the end of the line. See what the product's going to be. And you know what? It takes a long time. I don't know how long it takes them to produce a shelf, but I would say it depends on what shelf they're building. And it would depend on the quality. You know, one of their biggest uh, people, who buyers, is Cracker Barrel. And you go to Cracker Barrel or a restaurant, I mean, they have that stuff looking so nice in there, I almost want to buy it. And part of it is how they present it. But if you went in there and it looked like a garage sale, and the shelves were crooked, and you could walk by it a lot easier, couldn't you? But it, ta it takes something to do that. And for God to be in our lives, you're just going to have to accept it sometimes. And say, but you know what? My God knows better than I know. And on down the line, I'll understand. And so we as the Lord's people, what we need to do instead of questioning what God has done, is rather dig in and praise Him for what He's done. Notice this in verse 4. And patience, experience, and experience, hope. Experience. Uh, you know how much you know when you get out of nursing school? About enough to be dangerous. In, in four, you know what? How I became a good nurse? It's not the four years of college. It was watching other people and gaining experience. Yeah. The, the first injection I give, and I remember... I, I, when, when I'm nervous, I sweat. And had a wonderful lady. I, I guess she's still alive. I, I looked for her on Facebook one time. Miss Kathy Gibbons was one of our nursing instructors. And she goes, Larry, I got an injection for you. I'm like, well, I'm ready. She says, but there's a problem. And so I'm like, okay. I can still do this. She's 106 years old, and she's in tracks, and there's only one spot she can give it. And the best, the best place to... All of you have experienced shots, that's the best place to get them. But I had to give hers right here, that far from her surgical site. But you know what? Despite sweating, and I got it in there, give the medicine, and Miss Gibbons said, you did great. See, that was an experience I'll never forget. And you know what? Every time I give a regular injection, I think about that old lady in Jacksonville, I'm just glad I don't have to put it there. And give it again. You see what I'm saying? So there's reasons for experience. There's not one thing that happens by accident. And so our experience then should grow our patience. And the next time you have a difficult thing, remember that God's got a plan. And he's got something going on on your behalf. Go and meet Colossians. Uh, the little book of Colossians. Colossians chapter number 1, verse 9. Colossians chapter 1, verse 9. The Bible says, For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you. Now what he had heard, number 1, was of their faith. And the second thing he had heard of was their difficulty, their problems. It wasn't smooth sailing. It wasn't easy for the church at Colossus. Number one, they were Greek people. And Greek people, at least embracing some of the Jewish doctrine, because uh, to understand who Christ is, you have to understand what the Jew was. And, and, and they had embraced that, and no doubt they were receiving criticism. 
baptism. And so, and so he says, for this cause also, since the day we heard of it, of your problems, do not cease to pray, pray for you and to desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will. Now, another thing about trial and tribulation is finding out the will of God. Knowing what God individually wants for you. And, and you don't get that by sitting and watching TV and, and, and just hanging out. You get it by experience. The knowledge of His will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding that understanding that ye might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work. Now, you get that? Walk worthy of the Lord. Look different than most people. Act different than most people. Present different than most of the people on your workplace. Be a different kind of individual. And then he says in verse 11, Strengthened with all might, according to the glorious power, unto all patience, long-suffering, with joyfulness. Now, I want you to just strengthen by those experiences unto all patience. So the next thing, you know, when you get that, oh Lord, why have you done this? Well, maybe you need to be strengthened. Lord, I don't understand this. You don't need to understand it. Just accept it. You know, uh, I always go back to this. When things look bleak and Listen, I'm not, I'm not looking forward to this little knee deal. But I do know this. All things work to good, to good. All things work to good together to those who love the Lord. Amen. And who, those who are called according to His purpose. So, I don't know why it has to happen. But I'm just thinking this knee thing is going to be good. Only way I can really look at it, is it not? Mm -hmm. So, what is your faith like? This morning, how, how much confidence do, do you work? Do you really want patience? Do you want to be able to say in the Lord's good time, I'll understand it? Or do you want to be dissatisfied? Do you want to be unhappy? Do you want to be miserable? Do you want to be threatened? Which do you really want? Last place I'm going to read in Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 33. Hebrews 10 and 33. The writer says, partly whilst you were made a gazing stock, both by reproaches and afflictions. A gazing stock is someone that's stared at and made fun of because of their problems. And partly whilst you became companions of them that were so used. For you had compassion of me and my bonds and took joyfully the spoiling of your goods, knowing to yourselves that you have in heaven a better and enduring substance. Now, don't forget verse 34 because that's how the church in Jerusalem was helping out missionaries, and even though they may not have a lot, they were given some. Verse 35, Cast not away, therefore, your confidence, which has great recompense of reward. For ye have need of patience, that after ye have done the will of God, ye might receive the promise. Now, you know what each and every one of us need this morning? Patience. We really do. Uh, we live in a very much an instantaneous world, do we not? Uh, we don't like to wait. Uh, we don't like just to say, hang on a minute. Uh, right now. But you know what? You gain nothing in patience by that. When we began typing and you know at at work, literally one click of the mouse, and I can see every resident in our building. Uh, but you know what I still do? Because what I found is that click sometimes tells me wrong. And just like the twenty-five year old experienced nurse, twenty-five year nurse, not twenty-five year old nurse, I go with my little clipboard, and the girls make fun of me, and I'm like, "Is Mrs. Smith here?" Is Mr. Doe still here? And I count my patients one by one. And guess who's right most of the time? Me. Because see, but you know what it takes? That's a big old building. Y'all haven't seen it? Come see it. It's a beautiful building. 
but it's a big building, 108 private rooms, and I make that turf every morning. And it takes patience, but you know what? With patience, I get the right answer. I know for sure that individual's there. And so, what do you want? Good or mediocre? Yeah, or, or is mediocre okay? Uh, you want something instantaneous or you want something worth waiting for? You know, the Lord, the Lord's good to us. Just have a little patience. 